Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us uh, for the webinar AI in medical devices and uh, medical imaging applications. Uh, we will start in a little while. Uh, my name is Miki Chaimovich. I'm a VP Business Development with uh, RSAP Vision, a global leader in computer vision and deep learning. And uh, for this uh, webinar, I will be hosting Moshe Zafran, our VP R&D. Hello, Moshe. Hi, everyone. This is Moshe. Hi. OK, so let's start. Uh, we'll start with a few words regarding RSAP Vision. Uh, we are providing AI and deep learning solutions for image analysis. Uh, we don't do any other AI uh, solutions. Uh, some people do NLP, some people do other stuff. We focus on what we do best, which is uh, image analysis. Our solutions add value to the customer's products and services. Uh, we do not replace what the customer is doing, but rather we add to it. Uh, and the way we do that is that the solution is customized based on your project needs and your data set. Okay, and this is important because there are many AI players who've come up with some kind of innovative technology or a bright idea and they just develop it and they then look for customers to buy whatever they developed. But we have a different approach, an opposite approach actually. We start with the customer and his needs. We understand what the problem is uh, what the challenge is, uh, and then we have a look at the data set, okay, that no two data sets were created equal. They differ. This is a very um, diversified uh, industry. And then we just customize the data set, uh, so that, uh, the solution, so that we will be able to answer the, the, the question based on that data set, okay? This is a customized uh, solution. Uh, we've been doing that for over 25 years uh, with multiple repeat uh, clients, many of them large American uh, corporations. And we have ex extensive experience in all AI and deep learning techniques in uh, numerous medical and pharma applications. Uh, Moshe will touch upon that uh, in a second. Uh, we've, we have an experienced team, over 45 engineers uh, located in Tel Aviv, Silicon Valley, and Boston. Uh, that's quite rare in the AI world and definitely in the AI for medical uh, applications world to have such a large uh, team. And it makes us feel very comfortable regarding our ability to meet your needs. Uh, in addition to the AI experts, we also have a medical team in staff uh, to guide solution development, including radiology, pathology, and uh, more. So the bottom line is that in case you plan to develop an AI solution, uh, RSAP Vision uh, presents the safest, most stable way uh, to, to go about it. Um, as I told you, dozens of solutions for medical applications. We won't uh, linger uh, over all of them, but as you can see, uh, we have touched upon every modality, whether it is CT, MRI, ultrasound, uh, pathology, microscopy, OCT, everything. Uh, and the same goes uh, uh, to organs, okay? You can see a heart, you can see blood vessels, you can see uh, airways, uh, you can see bones, uh, pretty much everything we've been there and we've we've done that we're not a, an academic center okay we re, we build uh, real life solutions for people who sell real life uh, products and services uh, but every once in a while uh, an academic uh, research center knocks on the door and we don't refuse uh, so we work with uh, these guys as well uh, what you can see here is uh, something we've done with uh, tufts medical center uh, but it's not the only medical center that we've been uh, working with uh, along the years a little bit about our process. Um, it starts with the proof of concept. Uh, we don't ask you to uh, write a check the minute you walk in the door. On the contrary, uh, we start by uh, trying to understand the problem that you're dealing with, the challenge. Uh, so we sign the mutual NDA, CDA, etc. And then we define what parameters and deliverables are needed from the POC. Uh, the customer provides a few annotated samples uh, and we start the process. This can take up to a month. It can al also take a day. It all depends on the uh, flexibility of your uh, organization. Uh, and then we start developing a POC level solution that is based on the annotated samples that you have provided. This could take a few weeks. And once we're done, okay, we have now a good understanding of, you know, what the 
challenge is what we can do with the data set that was provided. We have conceptualized the right way to go about it AI-wise. And then we present it to the customer, which then defines the fully developed solution. Okay, how do we want it to, to look like uh, at the end of the process? And we develop the solution. Uh, of course, uh, this, it, this is an iterative process, uh, which includes uh, weekly discussions and updates regarding the solution development. Uh, the bottom line is that within a few months, you can have an AI solution that is uh, up and running as part of your uh, product or service. So that was the intro, and with that, I'll uh, hand it over to Moshe to talk to you about uh, the various applications of AI in uh, medical uh, devices. Moshe, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. My name is Moshe. I'm a VP R&D of RSAP Vision, and uh, I'd like to talk about AI in medical devices. So uh, as uh, we can see at the next slide, uh, as we all know, so uh, AI and image analysis is uh, really uh, dramatically uh, advancing and transforming uh, uh, the landscape. Uh, and this is due to a few factors. Uh, first of all, uh, the increasing availability of medical data. So there's more and more data, and uh, this is a very important factor in this revolution. And of course, uh, the advances in machine learning and neural network uh, technologies have made uh, things uh, possible that were not at all possible in the past, have made it uh, much uh, easier and faster to develop solutions. Uh, uh, these uh, technologies can mimic human co uh, cognitive functions, assisting medical teams to make better clinical decisions, uh, to plan medical procedures, and to assist during uh, uh, the procedure uh, in, uh, actually be integrated in medical devices. Uh, in fact, uh, sort of a rule of thumb these days is uh, if you can see it, if a reasonable human or a trained uh, uh, doctor can see it in the image, and if there's data, then uh, generally uh, AI will be able to see it as well. Uh, given the data and given the training examples, it can learn uh, to uh, really be a, a human level uh, uh, perception. And most of these solutions, uh, the state of the art of the more tech, uh, mature technologies in this field are based on supervised learning. So uh, generally it's uh, some uh, classifier, some uh, uh, AI that is learning from a labeled training example. Um, okay, so uh, we are very happy to be part of this uh, revolution. And uh, over the recent years, uh, we have done uh, many uh, interesting uh, uh, projects and as uh, Mickey said, a wide variety of modalities and tasks. So from segmentation of uh, various organs and chest CTs, uh, including uh, blood vessels, airways and lesions, to segmentation of uh, brain hemorrhage and edema uh, in, uh, in uh, brain uh, head CTs. Uh, we have a large uh, ongoing project uh, for medical device uh, dealing with spine surgery, uh, developing various algorithms there uh, in cardiology, heart chambers reconstruction, and also reconstruction of uh, uh, coronary arteries uh, in ophthalmology. Uh, we've uh, done a very nice project uh, uh, separating the layers of retina in OCT scans. Uh, so, lots of uh, very challenging and interesting things uh, going on in a variety of uh, fields. Um, so, uh, what one could think that this is a sort of a magic, or uh, as our CEO Ron says, uh, when you say AI, AI today, it's like saying software. Everybody's using it. Uh, so, one would think, yeah, I have the data, I have the annotations, I throw it into some black box, and it's going to work. And actually, it's not. Uh, not that easy. It's not plug and play by any means. Uh, and the first step is to select the current, uh, the correct and relevant technology for uh, a given task. So, uh, as I said before, uh, deep learning and neural networks are the leading machine learning uh, technology these days. You can see on the left a long list of uh, uh, older, uh, simpler uh, machine learning technologies, uh, support vector machines, random forests, uh, etc. And these are still in use, but. Uh, uh, less and less as uh, as the technology matures. Uh, and on the right, you can see uh, a long and uh, very uh, respectable list of uh, what's called classical computer vision technologies based on graph theory, uh, optimization technologies, uh, 3D reconstruction, uh, compression methods, uh, a very uh, rich uh, world of classical computer vision that is uh, not dead uh, by any means these days. And it really depends on the uh, problem, on the modality, on the task. And, uh, and also on the uh, data set that is available for a given task. Uh, so 
in the next slide, yeah, so a few rules of thumb. Uh, in many cases, we base our solution on neural networks and learning, supervised learning. In many other cases, we combine it in some way with a classical computer vision. Uh, and uh, it's important to uh, analyze the problem well and to understand what is the best solution, what will be the most effective solution given uh, uh, some uh, given time frame and some given scope. So for deep learning, if you have a big data set, if you're getting more and more data every day, uh, if you uh, uh, can use uh, uh, GPUs, uh, then yeah, you would go with deep learning. It's very good at classification tasks, at segmentation tasks, at diagnostics. Uh, there are, however, drawbacks beyond the need for a, a suitable data set. For instance, in many cases, the FDA is slower to accept uh, deep learning. To prove a classical algorithm, it doesn't mean necessarily you have your 510K approval for the deep learning solution because it's different technology. Uh, on the other side, uh, there's computer vision, and uh, in some cases, there's some uh, mathematical or physical uh, behavior or model behind the system. Uh, or there could be a small data set or limited availability of training uh, annotations. Uh, sometimes you need to measure uh, some very precise and exact measurements. And machine learning would not uh, necessarily be the uh, correct solution. Uh, and there are entire tasks uh, that are still uh, being done by non-learned uh, methods, such as uh, image registration. Uh, there are some deep learning works about that, but uh, in most cases, it's still done by methods that have been around uh, uh, for many years. Uh, yeah, so uh, other challenges in successfully implementing a machine learning solution. So AI is uh, these days synonymous with neural networks, and in a way this is synonymous with data. So by data, uh, it's not enough to have you know, your uh, set of uh, uh, inputs of CT scans or uh, whatever it is, x-rays or videos. Uh, you also need annotation. You need to teach the network, uh, teach the system what is the proper output. And in many cases, uh, this can be quite labor intensive. Uh, in many cases, it requires skills. So uh, um, there is, you know, a system uh, many of you may have heard about, such as Amazon Mechanical Turk, where uh, crowdsource uh, the task. And that's not always going to work in medical applications. Uh, many times you need medical supervision and uh, um, just uh, throwing at some a group uh, of people or even outsourcing it to a, a company that specializes in annotation uh, will not always work. Uh, and we find, uh, for instance, that the best practice for annotation is to combine in-house teams with outsourced teams. So yeah, if we have a very big task uh, that's very simple, then we have uh, partners that we work with that can do it at large scale and quickly marshal a large team. Uh, at the same time, we have an in-house uh, annotation team uh, with a higher level of training, and they're actually embedded in the development teams. And for more difficult annotation tasks, uh, this is very important, and it's very difficult to get a good result without having uh, the annotators, so to speak. Uh, they're actually highly trained people with uh, degrees of their own, uh, have them really uh, next to the developers and have them next to the uh, medical professionals who are providing uh, guidance. And, uh, uh, we provide both an annotation team as well as uh, automated or semi-automated tools to make things uh, more efficient. Uh, of course, it's not a, a dependent service, rather it's part of the of development of the AI solution. In many cases, can contain uh, this uh, uh, efficient and intelligent annotation. Uh, methods. Yeah, and of course, uh, so as I said, uh, deep learning uh, is not magic. It's not even just uh, software. Uh, there are many tricks of the trade. Uh, it's, it's more like engineering need to know uh, the best practices and to build on accumulated experience in particular tasks to select the correct type of neural network, how to process the inputs, how to create uh, augmented artificial samples, uh, and many hyperparameters of the system uh, to get an effective result uh, in a reasonable amount of work. Okay. So, uh, I'd like to move on to a, a small case study. Um, just wait for the next slide to come up. Moshe, yeah, yeah, I'm afraid we lost you for a second. Uh, you can just continue with this slide. Okay. Yeah, so uh, um, actually I'm, I'm done with this one, Mickey. Um, can we okay. move on to the, to the case study? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, just to sort of uh, uh, exemplify uh, uh, these uh, some of these issues, uh, I want to talk a bit about a case study in uh, bronchoscopy planning. So uh, as as we can see here, the input is a CT scan, a chest CT scan. Uh, so now this video is scrolling through the slices of the CT, uh, going uh, deeper and deeper into the patient. Uh, and here the lungs you can see are a darker area uh, with a lower density. Uh, and uh, then the airways are going to appear as very faint uh, tubes. So the trachea, the main airway, is going to be a very uh, thick, uh, dark area uh, at the top of the screen. Then it's going to uh, split into two branches. And then that's those two main branches, uh, those two bronchi split into uh, thinner and thinner branches. Uh, and uh, yeah, so um, in the next slide, uh, we can see uh, how it looks uh, zoomed in to a particular area. Okay, so in red, we have annotation of the airways in one slice of the CT. It's one slice of a three-dimensional tube. Uh, so uh, there's, the, uh, there's the outer tissue of the airway that's going to appear uh, sort of grayish. It's a, a bit uh, uh, higher density. And the inside of the airway is more uh, hollow. It's lower density, and it appears as a light color. Uh, and these are a very involved uh, three-dimensional uh, system. And the goal here uh, for the bronchoscopy preoperative planning was to perform segmentation of the airways. Okay, so you get the CT scan. And uh, what the user needs is a 3D model uh, in which to plan the navigation of the bronchoscope from the trachea into a specific area of the lungs uh, through a specific route uh, of turns in the airways. So, uh, yeah, so a few years back, we developed a classical algorithm for this uh, task, and it actually worked pretty well. And actually, the method we selected for this classical algorithm, there was a pretty rich literature about it uh, uh, those days before uh, deep learning was, uh, uh, was, uh, was being used for such tasks. Uh, actually, we found the uh, most effective classical solution was a very simple one, or at least it was based on a very simple principle. Uh, so you can see on the upper right, a flood fill, like a region growing. So you're starting with some dark pixel in the trachea that you find by some heuristic, and then you expand the region to uh, adjacent pixels of similar gray level. And at some point, you need some threshold where to stop, where, what the uh, brighter gray is of the uh, surrounding tissue. Uh, and one threshold is not going to be good. For the entire airway tree, you need to do it in steps. So first you do one branch, and then you split out to the next branch, and then each branch, branch gets its own threshold. Uh, and then if you get it wrong and the threshold is too low, there's going to be a leak. And then uh, we develop various algorithms. Uh, so that's what you can see on the upper right. In red, there's a very uh, salient area that's a leak, and one can develop other algorithms to measure and detect these leaks, and then backtrack, backpedal, you raise your threshold, and you get a correct answer. And uh, what comes out of this is some uh, uh, rather complex algorithm logic. Uh, so this is sort of a flow chart uh, of uh, one possible path this algorithm can take of going forward and back through each branch uh, um, using various rules to detect the leaks and eventually uh, building this uh, tree, as we can see on the left. Uh, and actually, this algorithm worked uh, uh, quite well, uh, despite its uh, basic simplicity. Uh, however, the running time could be up to 15 minutes, and the running time uh, would depend on the uh, on the uh, properties of the tree. So, the deeper the tree, the, longer, uh, the more difficult uh, uh, the task in a way. The more leaks you're detecting, the more times you have to backtrack, and then uh, the algorithm would take longer. Uh, and this was integrated into the customer system. Uh, they were using it; they were happy with it. But of course, they wanted that. Uh, to run uh, much faster, and of course, it's not so perfect. You always want things to be even more stable, even more accurate. Uh, so the next step, uh, a few years later, um, I think it's probably in the next slide, uh, was to pivot to deep learning. So the main motivation for this was actually to get the running time down, because with GPUs, same task. This is a, uh, a pretty huge input of the CT scan. It's a pretty big volume. Uh, and uh, using GPUs and using deep learning, the task uh, running time can be reduced to seconds instead of minutes, and also to improve, improve robustness. Uh, so usually the challenges uh, to develop such a solution in deep learning for uh, something like airways uh, segmentation would be the, uh, one of the uh, challenges would be the annotation, because it's very, very labor intensive to annotate by hand such a, a detailed uh, tree of airways. And here we said, 
okay, let's try to take a shortcut. We have our classical algorithm. Let's see if we teach the new robot using the results of the previous robot. Let's see what happens. So we throw this into the, uh, as training data, we take the result of, uh, of the old algorithm and use it to train the new algorithm. And lo and behold, not only does it work, but the neural network uh, actually, uh, besides running faster, was actually more stable than the algorithm that generated its training data. Uh, what seems to be happening is that these networks are generalizing over the noise. So if there's uh, some inaccuracy in one training example, the network would learn to ignore this because in other training examples, it's, it has seen counter examples uh, and it was actually more uh, robust and more accurate than the original training data. Uh, another advantage of the deep learning solution was, of course, it's extensible. So later on, we uh, manually annotated uh, some even thinner airways that the classical algorithm couldn't pick up. And this was a large scale effort. We actually outsourced it. Uh, and then uh, once we generated this training data, uh, the deep learning algorithm was able to generalize to the thinner airways without really developing any new algorithms. So to, to extend a classical algorithm to, to the thinner airways would probably be uh, like an order of magnitude more difficult than the original one because they're harder to see and it's harder to, uh, to develop rules for such objects. But the neural network was simply uh, extended once we got the architecture and the training practices uh, down for this particular task. It was easily uh, extendable by uh, uh, expanding the training data. Um, yeah, so uh, so it sounds, uh, I mean, it sounds great. It sounds uh, uh, relatively straightforward. There are also some uh, other interesting challenges in a project uh, such like this. For instance, how do you debug a neural network? So uh, in the next slide, we can see an example of uh, some of the errors of uh, neural networks that you get uh, while you're developing the solution and uh, stabilizing it and maturing it. So um, in the classical algorithm, many times it's easier to understand mistakes because you know uh, what was you know exactly what was happening inside the algorithm, and you know at what point uh, uh, the error was uh, generated or the wrong result was generated. You can debug it and try to tweak it and try to add more rules, etc. The neural network it's uh, something of a black box. It's not completely a black box, but in the end, you get a classifier. Uh, millions of parameters and it spits out these uh, results and they look great and occasionally uh, there are errors and at first you don't understand them at all. So uh, what we saw for this uh, network for instance at first is that it was making uh, gross errors such as this blue extra, uh, extra uh, volume uh, uh, specifically in the thicker airways. So its errors were actually in areas that were the easiest uh, for the classical algorithm. Uh, they weren't all that frequent, but they would happen occasionally. Uh, and uh, after uh, devoting some uh, thought and some time to this, uh, what we realized is that the network was seeing uh, much fewer examples of these uh, uh, thicker airway areas. There are much, so the network, you can't train the network on an entire scan because it's too big, it doesn't fit in the GPU. Uh, you need to train it on uh, patches of uh, a size similar to the ones we see in this image. And we realized that the network uh, during training is seeing much fewer patches containing the thicker airways, just because there are fewer of them, uh, much fewer of them by volume. And it wasn't devoting, quote unquote, enough of its uh, training uh, time, enough of its learning capability to uh, to generalize uh, over these uh, training patches. And then once we reweighted it and gave a, a special weight in the cost function uh, to these uh, particular pa patches, then we saw that uh, these uh, errors disappeared. Uh, and this is very typical. You get some result and you have to uh, uh, visualize it. You have to understand where the problem is coming from, and develop some a new trick or new training method uh, to overcome uh, such errors. So it's it's not like debugging a classical algorithm at all. It's uh, very different. It's more empirical sort of. Uh, and yeah, this this uh, this part for us was sort of the icing on the cake. So uh, what we found is that. Uh, we can uh, extend this algorithm or we can generalize it to many, many other tasks. So uh, we did not only uh, uh, get an airways uh, segmentation method uh, uh, by uh, applying some adjustments uh, uh, for each task, we basically uh, got ourselves a general purpose segmentation system. And today we offer a full chest CT segmentation. Basically, uh, we have uh, uh, the capability uh, uh, to perform segmentation of Almost any anatomical object you can see in the chest CT, whether it's 
blood vessels, lobes of the lungs, fissures between the lobes, pleura surrounding the lungs, the airways themselves, uh, bones, etc. Uh, and we also have extended uh, uh, the system to uh, an oncology application. So in the next slide, we can see uh, lung mass and nodules, lymph nodes. We can segment all these and use them uh, to uh, to read, uh, uh, to uh, measure the uh, response of the patient to various cancer medications, and track the lesions, CT scans, and uh, we're also moving towards whole body segmentation. So uh, we're going to many other organs as well, developing a full suite of uh, segmentation product, products. Um, so that that was a nice uh, a bonus to this whole project. Again, it's not the only focus of our uh, company, but uh, uh, it's a uh, one of uh, uh, the many AI Thank you very much, Moshe, for this talk. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Uh, I encourage you all to send the uh, questions. We, we have uh, already a few questions uh, uh, sent, but please do uh, continue. Uh, feel free to send more and more. That's why we're here. That's what we're here for. Uh, we're happy to, to answer the questions. Um, Okay, so let's see. First question: uh, How long does it take to develop such a solution? Uh, I think this is a recurring question. Uh, we were also asked that uh, during the previous webinar uh, last month. Uh, Moshe, what do you say? How long does it take? Yeah. So uh, the first sentence of the answer to the, such a question is usually it depends because it, of course, depends on the difficulty of the task, etc. Uh, but uh, for uh, segmentation solutions such as this, uh, the time was uh, something like three months and it was building on uh, accumulated experience. In the field. Okay, uh, another question. Let me see. Uh, what? How generic are these solutions? Uh, can one uh, solution that was uh, uh, designed for one proje project uh, suit other projects? Yeah, thanks. Great question. So uh, directly related to the slide that we're looking at right now, right? So um, it's uh, yes and no. So again, uh, we found by taking similar technology and making some tweaks uh, with relatively a small effort, we were able to uh, apply this technology to uh, uh, different and uh, various tasks. Um, but it's not the same uh, network. It's uh, it's not uh, it's not one uh, it's not one algorithm exactly, but they're uh, very closely related. Um, in general, AI is usually task specific, or it can be somewhat task specific. So you can uh, make a sort of semi-general uh, solution. You can teach the network to generalize. Maybe it's a, a pathology application. You can teach it to generalize over different colorings and different stains. Um, so it's not going to be uh, full-fledged general solution, but uh, you can get some uh, between modality generalization. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, what is the price of an AI solution? Uh, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, it's a very good question, of course, but uh, it really changes and differs between one project uh, and the other. Uh, because uh, different projects require different effort, different tools, different everything. So I can't give a, a ballpark uh, figure as to the cost and we we don't say that you know at the first meeting because we don't know we need to start a conversation we need to understand the challenge we need to have a look at the data set and then we can have a, a an, an estimation that we will of course share uh, with the customers uh, so that's the real answer however i know that people sometimes think wow well, a customized ai solution you know it's going to be in the millions so the, the answer is basically no we've done projects of, of millions of dollars but uh, not all projects are uh, are uh, so expensive and uh, basically you can allow yourselves an ai solution uh, in a very reasonable price uh, for people who, who work uh, within this uh, industry. Um, another question here, uh, can you uh, have an AI solution for uh, every modality? Motion? Yeah, so, so that's uh, uh, basically related to the uh, previous uh, question about the generalization. So for, not for every uh, modality, 
Um, in general, you would uh, develop a separate solution uh, for each modality. Um, but the basic technology itself is somewhat modality agnostic. We say, you know, if it's an image or a video or a point cloud, uh, we can use it. There's no inherent limitation to a specific modality. It's more like uh, uh, adapting uh, the technology to each uh, particular modality. Okay, now I, I think, uh, you know, the, the meaning was uh, that, you know, there is no modality that we can say up front that AI would not uh, fit, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, including uh, IHC images I see here, and yes, we, we can do uh, IHC images. Uh, another question, uh, what are the benefits of the AI solution? Uh, well, it really all depends on what you're trying to solve, of course. Uh, but in, in a nutshell, I would say that uh, they can be very accurate, okay? The, the levels of uh, sensitivity and specificity are, are, uh, are very, very high. Uh, maybe we'll uh, dedicate an, a webinar in the future to that uh, specific uh, subject. Uh, they're very consistent. Okay, uh, people, you know, sometimes they're tired, sometimes they're sick, sometimes, you know, something happened to them and, and you know, they err. Uh, softwares don't tend to do that uh, as often. So they're pretty uh, much uh, consistent. And, you know, once they're trained properly, they'll be uh, very accurate and very consistent. Uh, another uh, advantage I would say is uh, that uh, it can do things very, very quickly. Uh, you know, if you have a group of uh, radiologists and they need to work for hours, you know, it, it takes it takes time. It takes it it, it costs money. Uh, the computer can do that very uh, quickly and uh, in a very cost-effective uh, uh, manner. Uh, let's see what else are we being asked. Uh, please continue to send your questions. We we have time, so we'll be happy to answer them all. Um, can you, uh, ah, okay, uh, the question here is, uh, can the system train itself or does it have to be trained? Moshe? Yeah, so th there are some uh, uh, unsupervised uh, sort of type of technologies. There are ways to, I don't know, teach the system uh, what the typical data is and then uh, teach it to teach anomalities without it seeing every each and every type of anomality. Um, but uh, in general, usually uh, the solution is based on training data. These are the more t uh, mature technologies are based on supervised learning, uh, which means you need the data and you need some way of annotating it. However, you don't need to do it yourself. Um, we can usually do it for you and expedite it uh, with the help of other algorithms. Okay, and, and another follow-up question is whether we can skip the annotation uh, stage. And this is again a, a recurring question uh, from the audience and from the, the, the prospects and, and customers. So it, it's really important to emphasize that yes, annotation could be a, a hassle and a hurdle, but uh, if, if for the first stage for the POC, with our help, uh, it doesn't need to take too long, okay? The number of samples that we need for the POC is limited, and we have the team uh, in-house, uh, the annotation team, and we can provide you with annotated, uh, 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 automatic annotation tools that can do that in several hours, okay? So, you know, within a few days, uh, you can be uh, over with the first stage of uh, annotation. Uh, so this is not a reason not to start uh, the conversation. Okay, I am saying that clearly because I know that sometimes, you know, I speak to people and they say, oh my God, no, I just, I can't handle the annotation. So it's not as uh, as horrible as you might uh, think. Um, another question here. Um, in segmentation problems such as airway reconstruction, what is the resolution uh, deep learning approach uh, provides? Basically, it's the resolution of the CT. So it could be a millimeter or half a millimeter, depending on the particular uh, CT, depending on the voxel size. Uh, but uh, it could be the uh, same uh, resolution as the input itself. Uh, you were a bit cut, Moshe. So just to make sure I, I understood it, basically, the, the deep learning is limited only by the modalities uh, resolution. Yeah, it's limited only by the, the input resolution. Yeah. Okay. We don't need to downscale it or anything like that. 
Okay, and another solution, another question on the more on the organizational side. Can you uh, combine an AI uh, solution that uh, was developed in house with uh, RSAP uh, AI solution? Moshe, what do we say to that? Uh, yes, uh, many times, uh, I mean, usually we provide the customer with some module uh, to be integrated in some wider software, and it can also be a wider AI uh, a solution. We define some interface uh, between us to define exactly what our job is and what your job is, and uh, work together to perform the integration um, in a professional manner. Okay. Um... Did you train the ANN on samples with patients who had, uh, no, I don't quite understand that question. I'll move to the next one. Um, do you help the customer prepare the data for the project? What process and tools do you use to, that, to do that? Well, I, I think we touched upon that. Uh, we definitely help them. Uh, again, all the annotation uh, could be done uh, with our um, real support both uh, we, uh, with the personnel that we have in-house and with um, the an annotation tools that we provide. Um, mm -mm -mm. Can these solutions run in real time or mainly offline analysis? Moshe? Okay, so specifically uh, CT segmentation, I wouldn't call it real time. It runs in uh, seconds, something like 20 seconds. So it's not exactly real time. Uh, in other cases, yes, in other cases, uh, uh, you can uh, develop a very uh, small uh, network and run at uh, real-time uh, capability. So the, the, there are AI applications that uh, that run in, in real-time or in near real-time, uh, yes. like uh, inter intraoperative uh, scenarios and stuff like that, right? Absolutely, yeah. You can do object detection uh, uh, more or less in real-time. Um, you can do 2D segmentation at uh, close to real time, at least. 3D segmentation is more computationally intensive, so that uh, that you wouldn't get at real time. I understand. Okay, uh, a good question here. Uh, in cases where the anatomy is abnormal, the training data would be limited. Can we expect less accuracy? So uh, I can say that these models were not trained only on uh, healthy patients. So uh, they work uh, not they, they don't work only in healthy patients. Uh, thanks. I'll I'll add to that that uh, this is not a coincidence. We plan it this way. Uh, of course, many of the customers, the challenges that they want to uh, deal with are uh, regarding abnormal uh, abnormal uh, uh, issues. And what we do is we show or we train the, the, the platform uh, based on samples that present such uh, abnormal uh, issues so that the um, uh, system will be uh, perfectly trained to handle them as well. Uh, I will also say that uh, it is very important precisely for that reason that we will have uh, samples that uh, are uh, very different from one another. Okay, uh, if we have, uh, let's say, uh, five uh, 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 scans of the same patient, then, you know, we're at risk of, you know, building a solution that would fit that specific patient. So always make sure that your uh, samples are as diversified as uh, possible. Um, another question. Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, why is deep learning not being more readily adopted in medical uh, imaging to date? Moshe, do you have an good idea? Question. We're working on it. Uh, I think <laughs> sometimes, sometimes perhaps the perhaps the regulatory uh, uh, factors are uh, somewhat conservative, but uh, it, it is possible to get these things approved. It's yeah, just, uh, maybe the system is less uh, familiar with it uh, than uh, than more uh, traditional uh, techniques. I, I second that, and I will also add that uh, w with regards to FDA approvals, uh, our solutions uh, do not require having an FDA so, uh, approval uh, for them specifically. 
okay so you know once our ai uh, model uh, is being added to the medical device uh, the medical device as a whole is given the fda approval and that's not a problem we we've had many uh, customers uh, who, who's, who've done that um so i don't think we can uh, say that uh, only with regards to the i mean i i don't think we can attribute uh, this uh, only to the fda i do think that uh, this is a pretty conservative industry uh, for many good reasons uh, but not only because of good reasons and uh, you know the the general sentiment that i get in uh, those uh, ai in medical conferences i attend uh, every now and then is that the industry uh, leaders understand that uh, they understand that uh, they can't be conservative forever and this is something that we will see changing and I even see that changing from one conference to the other. Like there are more and more projects out there, there are more and more people presenting a nice uh, innovative AI uh, ideas and uh, things are definitely uh, in motion. Um, another question, can we see? Can we see bone and fine nerve tissues by implementing deep learn, learning method in CT scan? I've seen an article uh, on hardware of CT equipment by uh, someone. Please explain. Uh, Moshe, can we see uh, fine nerve uh, tissues uh, in DL? The, the first one was bone, so bone uh, definitely yes. Uh, we've done segmentation of uh, most, most of the bones in the body, I would say. Um, uh, personally, I haven't been involved in a project of fine nerve tissue, so I'd have to see the images and see exactly what it looks like. Um, yeah, we, we've done things that are harder to see, though, like uh, lymph nodes that are sort of uh, harder even for humans to see in the CT. But it, it depends how salient it is uh, in the data. If really you can't see it yourself by eye, then uh, you, the AI probably won't be able to see it either but uh, I need to see how it looks to answer that uh, more intelligently. Okay, I, I'll second that. Uh, basically, uh, you know, if you can see it and, you, and it, it's there in the image, then we can work with it. Okay, uh, in addition to all our uh, projects in the medical world, we've done projects in completely different uh, uh, markets, uh, looking at completely different types of pictures. So we can say that, uh, you know, our solution is very robust. We have not yet uh, encountered uh, an image that, uh, you know, we couldn't tackle. Uh, and uh, that should be the, the assumption. So don't be, you know, don't think, okay, maybe my images are not, uh, uh, would not fit, or, you know, I can't do that with AI. Uh, just give us a call and, and we'll find out for you. And in most cases, uh, the answer would be yes. Uh, okay, I think we've, uh reviewed all the uh questions let me have another look uh yeah i think we have so uh thank you very much everybody for uh, attending uh it's been great uh thank you moshe for the talk and um, stay tuned for our next uh, webinars. Uh, it will be pretty much uh, once a month or, or so, or every few weeks. Uh, we're always happy to discuss these issues. We're also always happy to answer questions. Uh, if you really can't wait, uh, then I encourage you to contact us uh, directly. Really don't be shy. Uh, we like to think ab about ourselves as part of the AI uh, community. And we're always happy to talk to people, uh, really just, uh, you know, uh, us, give us a call, and uh, and we'll be happy to talk. So thank you, Moshe, and thank you, everybody, and see you next time. Thank you very much.